Here we are going to talk about socializing timid cats. So this is going to be a step-by-step -step approach, instruction guide, if you will. So the overview is having a separate room, offering lots of hiding spots, using scents, pheromones, and facial brushes, having scratching posts and cat trees, how to set up the room, having people equal food and building that positive association, increasing confidence through play and toys, using a stick to touch first, all about the consent test, and then when to let them out of that separate room. So in terms of a separate room, acceptable options would be an office, a bedroom, or a bathroom. If you use a bedroom, just make sure that the cat can't access under the bed. Either you have a bed that has a, that has a cover or sits on the floor or there's just no underneath or you're able to block that off really securely so that the cat can't get underneath just because it makes it very difficult to socialize a cat if they're hiding under the corner of your bed and you can't get to them. Unacceptable options would be a laundry room because of noise, furnace room because of noise, open or unfinished basement because it's a, too large of a space, and an unfinished basement, you might risk them getting into places that we can't access them or that might be dangerous for them. And then the living room or kitchen, those are also too large. So it needs to be a separate kind of private, quiet room. Why is this separate room so important? It is significantly less overwhelming of a space than just bringing them home and letting them roam around the entire home all at once. And it makes socialization and interactions a lot easier having that separate room. And it prevents them from hiding where you can't find them. It makes it very difficult to socialize a cat if you don't know where they are. Hiding spots are very important. The key points about hiding spots, having more than one. They're not necessarily going to love the only one that you put out. So give a, a few just so that they can decide which one is most comfortable. Have at least one to two that are up high just because cats can feel more comfortable and secure when they're higher and have that vantage point to watch what's going on below and make sure that they're accessible so that you can work on socialization. Under the bed is not accessible. Hiding options can include a cat carrier, cardboard boxes turned on their side, and cat trees and cubby holes. The picture here is what I mean by cubby holes, and some cat trees have those, which is really nice. So if you're using cat carriers or boxes, place them on top of dressers, shelves, tables, counters, just to get them off the floor and uh, elevate them so that the cat has that vantage point. And to make it comfortable, put a blanket inside and then also put a blanket over top the box or carrier just to reduce their exposure and make them feel a little bit more hidden. So if you have a if you're using a box and you turn it on its side, you can still put a blanket over to cover, say, the first half of the opening. Still leave it open on the bottom half so that they can look out, but just covering the top half can make it feel more enclosed and safe. Why do we not want to take the hiding options away? Hiding makes them feel secure. It helps them feel more comfortable. And removing that is going to increase their fear and stress, and it's going to delay the social progress that they make. If you don't provide a hiding option for a scared cat, they will find their own, and cats are very creative. They uh, can get into walls, ceilings, we've seen them in vents, bed frames, and it can be, again, dangerous for them, uh, but also very difficult to, uh, to help them if they're hiding in uh, such peculiar places. Sense pheromones and facial brushes. So by spreading the cat's own scent around the room, we can make it feel more like home in that room, and that can increase their comfort and increase their confidence. So... 
Pheromones are uh, not the same as scents. They are chemicals that are released when cats rub their face against things, when they bunt and rub their head against things, or even when they scratch, they can release pheromones through their, uh, their paws. And so all of these things are how they spread their scent and mark areas, if you will. And uh, so a scared cat is is not necessarily confident or comfortable enough to start walking around the room scratching and marking it so we can help by doing that for them so if we can take a towel or a bed that they have laid on don't take the one that they're currently laying on uh, but one that smells like them and just rub it on the walls around the room or on the corners of the furniture in the room obviously at their height so that if they are out venturing smelling around they can smell it easily because it's at their eye level and then feel away is a a pheromone product that mimics those same pheromones and uh, pheromones in general can help put cats in a calmer state and so that's essentially what feel away can do is help do that by having us spray it on their bedding and on furniture around the room it can just be one extra piece of the puzzle that can help them feel more comfortable now the feel away spray only lasts a few hours, so you do have to spray it at least twice a day. If you can do three times a day, fantastic. And remember, it does have an alcohol base, so it takes about 10 minutes for that alcohol smell to go away. So please don't spray it right near the cat, because uh, it might smell quite unpleasant for 10 minutes, and we don't want them associating you with a terrible smell. If you get a feel away diffuser, you can put it in the room and it lasts for a month and you don't have to do any maintenance with it. It just releases the pheromone into the air. And then having these face brushes like in the picture here and putting them on your walls in that room. Uh, it's just one more opportunity for them to come out and rub their face on it and mark on their own. And it feels nice and cats like to do it, so it can be a bit enriching as well. Scratching posts and cat trees. So scratching and climbing are things that cats like to do. And so by having these, it allows cats to perform natural behaviors, which can increase enrichment and they can it can increase confidence. Scratching, like I said, it can be how they mark uh, their scent, their pheromones, and um, so we want to encourage that so that this space, this room, is more comfortable for them. If you have a cat tree or a scratching post, ensure it is solid and sturdy. Cats will avoid it if it wobbles or um, falls on them, so uh, make sure that it is solid. And variety helps in terms of scratching options. So in the first picture here, you see one hung on the doorknob, and I believe that's a, a more carpet material, and that's a vertical one. The second image is a horizontal one, and it's made of cardboard. So there is a huge variety. Those particular two options are really cheap um, compared to, say, a scratching post, but huge variety of textures and... Uh, uh, the horizontal versus vertical variety and every cat has a different preference so having a variety can help figure out what this cat's preference is. You can add catnip to these things to encourage uh, its their use and uh, do not add feel away to scratching posts. Feel away can actually work to minimize scratching so uh, well scratching that happens because of marking which can sometimes be what cats are doing on our furniture couches and chairs and so you can actually use feel away to spray on your couches and chairs to discourage scratching as a marking behavior on those items so uh, you want to make sure not to spray it on things that you want them to scratch setting up the room when we're talking about any average cat, the default is to spread out resources. We want to spread out their litter box and their food and their resting area because nobody wants to eat on the toilet. Nobody wants to sleep on the toilet. When we're talking about a timid cat, there's a bit of an exception. We don't want to put all of those things clumped right together but we do want to bring it in a bit more. So when you see this first example with the big X across it, you can see how the litter box and the food are placed in such a way that 
it exposes the cat. It, it makes them more vulnerable if they go to eat or use the litter box, given where their comfortable hiding spot is in relation to the doorway. And the food and litter are kind of right in between that. And so it might decrease their chance of actually going to get food during the day when humans are up walking around or using the litter box. In the second example with the check mark, you see how the litter and food are closer. So we still want to have some space so that they're not resting and eating near the toilet, but it's a bit closer so it's more likely they'll venture out of their uh, hiding spot to use the litter box and eat the food. People and food. We want to associate people with food. We want to build that positive association so that they start to like us and see that we are a good thing. Initially, these timid cats are not going to eat in front of you. Totally normal, totally expected, don't feel bad. It takes time to get there. So what you can do is leave the kibble out at all times, but you should be the source of wet food. And I don't mean having wet food in a bowl, taking it in, setting it down and leaving. Yes, that does mean that you equal wet, equal wet food, but it's not significant enough or frequent enough for it to have the same impact as if we're doing it in small increments by breaking that up into 10 little pieces in one meal and walking in 10 times and setting down wet food 10 times. I want to give a big caution around having food equal petting. Food is the good thing. And at this point for the timid cat, petting can be a scary, unpleasant, or uncomfortable thing. And so we want to avoid having the good thing, food, be followed up by the scary thing because what it can do is actually poison or taint the food and make them more uncomfortable eating it, worried about what's going to happen next, worried about the petting that follows up with it. So be careful around that and definitely avoid it at all costs in the beginning as the cat is still settling in and getting to know the people and the routine. There are a few ways that we can work with food. So this is Faye and you can see she's hiding under a blanket. This is the first day, one of the first days she was back at the shelter. And so uh, this was a new environment for her. I'm a brand new person and I know there's no way in heck she's gonna eat anything from me because she's too scared, she's too uncomfortable. And it's hard to see, but you can see her pupils are very, very dilated. So first thing we can do is pre pre present food and wait patiently. I like to feed a bit of wet food off of a butter knife. You can use whatever is comfortable for you, but I find just scooping out a little bit with the knife and presenting it to the cat is really quite handy. So let's see. Here I reach the butter knife in. I get a big hiss. She licks her lips. That can be a big sign of stress. She's not doing anything. She's not sniffing it. She's not having any kind of positive response. She's frozen. And actually, if you look at her closely, it almost looks like she's not breathing and she, she's very tense. Now that I've moved it away, you almost see a little bit of that tension release and you can almost see like her move as if she's taking a breath. So that in and of itself can give us a baseline by just holding the food there seeing if they sniff it, do they not sniff it, do they freeze, are they tense, are they scared, do they start to growl, do they swap the, the knife with the food away. So just holding it there for 10 seconds can give us information and can give us a baseline for where we're at. You can also present the food and then leave it for three to five minutes. So for these guys, I uh, I did the same thing, and I apologize. I when I reach my hand in, it kind of covers up the cat faces, so that's my apologies for that. But here I reach it in, and can't really see, but but they weren't having a a significant response to it. They weren't really interested in it. You can kind of tell he's not sniffing or leaning in. He's just kind of staring. And so I hold it there and I give him a chance and then I decide, okay, let me just set this down and give him some time to feel comfortable eating it with me not there. So now I, I don't know what I was doing. I, I did make some noise. So this is, this is not the best example, but I just wanted to show it. 
and then come back. That wasn't a long time and he didn't need it. Okay, so if you do that, which I recommend you do, it'll help things move along. Present the food, leave it with them and walk out of the room for three to five minutes. There are many times in the shelter when I will close the cage door and I'll step back so they can't see me. And I will just wait for a few minutes and I can sometimes hear them licking it or eating it. And then I'll wait a few more seconds until they're done. I don't wanna go back while they're eating because that might scare them once they're done. And I go back in calmly and then I might take the knife and give them more and do that again. And then again and again and again. And you may find the first time you do have to wait five minutes, maybe even 10 minutes. But as, as you do it more, you may only have to wait 30 seconds and then 15 seconds. Once the cat learns that this is a predictable game, uh, they know what to expect. They know what's going to happen. They know that you walk in, you replace the food, give them more. And so they're more comfortable because they know what's going to happen. They trust the food. They're going to eat the food. It's a, a pleasant experience. This is Faye again from uh, the video before the last. And uh, by this point, I've spent a lot more time with her, and she has eaten off the knife for me. But watch here how what I do is offer her the food. I still get that hiss response. And important to remember that cats don't hiss intentionally. It's actually an automatic response. So it's something that happens subconsciously. Um, so very, very important to not be punishing cats or speaking sternly to them when they hiss because it's... Um, a response. It's a fight or flight response. It's not them deciding to. Okay, so I presented the food. She's sniffing it, but she's not eating it. So I take it away just as a, a way to reset. And then I give her the food back to see again. Try one more time. And I'm not changing anything on the, the knife. It's the same food. She's showing interest. She's sniffing for it. She doesn't want to eat it yet. And I know that she has eaten for me in the past. So here we go. Finally, she's eating it. Okay, so what's the difference between holding it for 10 to 15 seconds and uh, taking it away and representing it? There, the difference is when we are holding it there, it's usually because they're not having a response to it. They're frozen, like she was in that video that I showed. She was totally frozen. She had no interest in the food. I just wanted to hold it to see if that might change. In this situation where we're offering it and then taking it away to reset and then offering it again, the cat is showing interest in it. They're sniffing it or their body language is otherwise not tense and frozen. They're showing interest in the food. We just wanna offer a way to reset. And for some timid cats, if uh, I really like the knife because it, it gives space and it protects hands and it keeps, you know, hands might have been associated with scary things. So it takes hands a little bit more out of the equation and offers something a bit more neutral. So I really like using the knife. But if you need to create even more space, because maybe this particular cat is, uh, is more extremely scared or timid, tossing treats can be a nice way to do that. If you're tossing them into the cat's carrier, make sure the carrier has a blanket under because I find if um, it's just the hard plastic and you toss it in, it's not a crazy loud noise, but it it does make a little clang noise and um, sometimes startles the cats. So just keep that in mind. And for this particular example, I am just handing this little kitten the treats, but uh, I went from tossing them and now uh, he's a bit more comfortable. But you see how he backed away from my hand. He came in to sniff and then he backed off. So I said, okay, no problem. I'll just leave the treat here with you and I'll get my hand out of here. And then he was comfortable enough to eat it. And so I try that again and he's uh, not approaching my hand. It looked like he kind of was about to and then he backed off and waited. Not a problem. The important thing here is that he's eating in front of me. His comfort and confidence is uh, high enough 
that he's eating in front of me. And that's a, a huge stepping point for a lot of timid cats. Increasing confidence through play and toys. So similar to eating in front of you, initially they're not gonna play in front of you. Play is a very vulnerable thing. And even as humans, if we're feeling uncomfortable or insecure, we tend not to get our playful mood out. Um, we tend not to feel comfortable enough to be silly, which goes right hand in hand with play. And the same is for animals. If they are scared or fearful and shut down, they are not confident or comfortable enough in that moment to play. But by dragging toys around and making the wand toy move around like a mouse or a bird, it can get them into more of a playful state. It takes time. You do have to keep at it. It's not going to happen in the first session or the second or maybe even the fifth or seventh, but it will happen and you'll see that progress. And um, it's very rewarding for the human, but it's very beneficial for the cat as well because it gives them a confidence boost. So it can feel very boring if the cat is not lunging at the toy or racing around the room, but you have to remember it's, it's, it's still extremely beneficial for the cat, no matter how boring it might be for you. And remember that progress can include watching the toy. So at first, I find a lot of timid cats don't even look at the toy because they're so focused on me and, and I make them uncomfortable. And so they're watching me to make sure that nothing scary happens. But as they become more comfortable, their eyes come off of me and starts to go towards the toy. So let's look at Faye. And I'll just start by saying this is about a two minute video. And um, so pay attention to what happens in two minutes. And you see that she's watching the toy. You know, you might have noticed that she looked up at me. So she does. She does keep checking me out. Uh, but also sometimes I think she might be looking at the top of the toy to see where it's coming from. And notice how I keep dragging, dragging it around in front of her like a little rodent might move. And I like to move it out of her sight also so that she has the opportunity to go, oh, where did it go? And just kind of pique her interest a bit. Um, this was immediately after I did some feeding with her. So I think she's licking her lips because she did just eat um, some wet food. Um, otherwise, licking of lips can be a sign of stress. But look at her watching the toy. She even moved forward slightly, showing that she's interested. And see how it kind of went out of sight and she moved forward a little bit more to follow it. I think there she looked up at the top of the toy because it came closer. That's okay. Then I just move it. Uh, one thing I find... Uh, that cats like is when the toy actually stops in front of them for a few seconds and then has a brief jerking movement. I find that really gets cats going. I swing it around. If the cat's in the carrier, it's kind of nice because you can just move it back and forth in a, in a strategic mouse-like way, but because they have a specific watching window. See how she keeps looking up at me? So she's back on the toy now. That's good. And I stopped it. So you can see how this isn't super duper exciting, but she's watching it. She's engaged. Whoa, look at that. She threw her paw out to catch it. That is incredible progress. That shows a level of security and comfort that was not there in previous days with Faye at the beginning of uh, her stay with us. So you're not going to get that swat or lunch for the toy in the first session. That is going to take probably weeks, maybe even a month or more before you actually get to that point, depending on how timid the cat that you're working with is. But don't give up. You will get there. Not every cat is as toy motivated as others. So it also depends on that. But it's really, really important to stick with it. 
touch with the stick. So this is um, really just touching them the way that you would with your hands, but with a stick first. And I like to use a wand toy. I use the other end of the wand toy. The benefits of doing this are one, human safety. If you don't know the cat and you don't know how they're gonna react to hands, you just eliminate the risk of a bite or a scratch. And cat comfort, because uh, hands may have been associated with scary things like being caught, grabbed, handled roughly, maybe a, an intake exam that involved hands, of course. These kinds of things uh, can make hands a bit scary. And so the stick is a neutral stimulus. It's something that hopefully they don't have any previous experience with. And so it gives us a bit more of a blank slate to work off of. And it gives a bit of distance, just like feeding the food with the knife gives a little bit of extra space for the cat. So does the, the stick when we're trying to start that touching. So when we're introducing the stick, you can make it smell good by putting a little bit of food on the end or catnip or even their own scent by just rubbing the end of the stick on a blanket that they've been laying on or their bed and then present it to their nose for them to sniff. And if this is the first time that you're doing this with this cat, represent it a few times. So you'll let them sniff it for a few seconds, you might take it away, and then just offer it again. And it just allows them to see, okay, nothing scary is happening. This stick isn't doing anything weird. It just kind of smells cool. Nothing scary. And then after a few times, you can give a very gentle and brief one stroke on the cheek, just along their whiskers, where you know how cats rub their mouth or their cheek on items when they're marking it, just along that line, and then take it away. So just once, and then take it away. And then present it again for them to sniff, and then you can do one gentle stroke, take it away. Present it for them to sniff, a gentle stroke, and take it away. And it just by doing that process, it keeps it from becoming an overwhelming experience by petting too much with a stick too fast. So it gives them a break, a little bit of a moment to kind of evaluate what happened, process what happened, and then be reintroduced to the stick. And again, it shows them that, okay, it's not terribly scary. Nothing extremely dramatic happened. The stick just touched my cheek, okay. And you can also have the cheek stroke equal food or treats by offering a treat or a bit of wet food after you do the stroke. So that would look like presenting the stick, let them sniff it, do a cheek stroke, take that away, give them a treat, let them eat it, and then represent, let them sniff, cheek stroke, take it away, give them a treat. And this is just associating the cheek stroke with something positive so that not, not only are they saying, okay, okay, that's not so bad, but also they're saying, oh, that results in food. Okay, maybe I like that. I can get on board with this. So here's an example with a timid cat. And uh, I am at a bit further along stage. So you'll notice I don't um, let him sniff it, do one stroke and take it away. but You'll also see um, he's not opposed to it the way that you will see some cats back away from it. So he kind of subtly is leaning his, uh, his uh, head, neck, cheek into it. So I do a bit of scratching and I take it away and I let him sniff. He doesn't really want to sniff it. Okay, I'm going to go in and try that again though. Still a bit of... Uh, kind of subtle leaning in. It's nothing super hard. I let him sniff it. He's still not, so he's not initiating it. He's not really sniffing it, but when I initiate it, he's showing that he enjoys it. So, you know that, like we're halfway there with that, but the end goal is really for him to say, I like that. Let me nudge this stick and tell you that I want more. So he's not initiating it, but he's showing it's not so bad. And then I kind of do by the ear and then the forehead. And every time I represent, he's not initiating again, but he still continues to lean in. And now he's leaning in a bit more than he was at the beginning. 
So it's great that he's leaning in. That's what we want, but that's not the end goal. Our end goal is for them to ask for it, to say, hey, that felt awesome. I don't want you to stop. Keep doing it. So that leads me into the consent test. The consent test is really simply just giving cats an option. This, I mean, use this for every animal, dogs too. And uh, it's just presenting your hand or the stick and giving them the choice to nudge for interaction or do nothing, and then we don't proceed. So uh, with the video previously, that cat wasn't initiating it, but with a timid cat, you will find they're not going to initiate it at first. But we wanna be careful to watch their body language. So if the cat is backing away from it every time, then we need to take a step back. But if they are tolerant of it, if they are leaning in subtly the way that that cat did, and the more we did it, he leaned in more, we're moving in the right direction. We just wanna make sure that we're not moving backwards and that we're not doing it too much to overwhelm them. But the goal is to get to a point that where when, that when we offer the consent test, which is just offering our hand, that they are gonna ask for petting by nudging it. Okay, so by using the consent test, it gives cats options, which gives them control, and uh, all of us, humans, ev animals, when we have control over a situation, it increases our confidence and decreases our stress. There is nothing more anxiety provoking than not having control over a situation, and that can be very scary and uh, induce a lot of negative emotions, so this helps to eliminate those. It makes them want the interaction. It encourages them to ask for it, and the end result is a cat who seeks out affection rather than those interactions being mainly initiated by humans. And who doesn't want a cat that comes to you for attention? Let's look at this video of Nelson demonstrating the consent test. So look what he does when my hand's there, leans in. His body language is soft. Again, leans into my hand when I stop it. His eyes are soft. I tried to move my hand away there, but he uh, stretched his neck forward to keep the rubbing going. And he is leaning into all of this. And every time I take my hand away, you see, that he continues to push his face into it, which is his way of asking to be pet. Again, he is rubbing into it and he's leaning into it, showing us that he's enjoying this experience. One more example of that consent test with Tarzan here. And again, let's watch his body language because there is a moment, look at him, he's kind of needing all positive things. I present my hand. And he leaned into it there after give it a little lick. I think it tasted like food. And uh, he's a bit more subtle than Nelson. He's uh, not as far along as Nelson in the socialization process. And then notice, I didn't, that wasn't consent. He didn't ask for that, but he's still leaning in. But then he backed away, so I backed away. That's important, pay attention to that. Backing away is something so simple and can be so subtle. And it's something that I find as humans, we often overlook. If an animal backs away from us, we tend to move in closer and we need to change our uh, behavior with that. If an animal backs away from us, we need to back away. That is them saying, give me space. And we wanna say, I heard you, gotcha, loud and clear, I'm gonna give you space. The more that their communication is respected and understood, the better we read them, the faster they're gonna make progress. When to let them out of their separate, that separate room. So only once these two criteria have been met, should a cat be exiting that separate room in your home. One, they're asking for more petting when you stop. So when you offer your hand for that consent test, they are rubbing their hand against you because they want to interact. So that is a social check mark. And two, they're not running away from you when you enter the room or approach them. Instead, they're either remaining where they are, relaxed, comfortably, 
or they are actively approaching you. If you let them out of the room before either of those things, it's gonna make it significantly more difficult to socialize them. And also, how are you gonna socialize a cat that's running away from you when you put them in a bigger space? You're gonna make it more difficult for you and the cat. So it's really gonna delay and hinder the progress if you let them out of the room before they're ready. Some important points to remember. This is not a process that can be rushed and rushing can cause major setbacks. Patience is essential and it's going to get you farther faster and it'll feel more rewarding when you see those little differences, when the cat first finally eats in front of you, when the cat finally leans in for a pet, those are going to be big moments and they're going to mean a lot more if you go at the cat's pace. Pay attention to the cat's body language. Like I said, if they're backing away, if they are tense, you have to cater your next step to their body language, which is what tells you where they're at, the, pro the progress stage that they're at. And back off when they communicate that they are uncomfortable. This whole thing can take weeks or months before a cat is comfortable with you and seeking out attention. So it's not a race. Remember that. Try not to rush it. It's okay that it takes a long time because these are timid cats who uh, are scared of people either because of a transition or because they haven't had a whole lot of socialization. And we need to make sure that all the experiences they have from this point forward are positive and gradual and only what they are capable of handling and not more than that.